First of all, I would like to thank IKEA for inviting me. It's uh, really an honor to, to be here for you. With pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, excuse me for not speaking German. I am really happy that I understood some bits of what my colleagues before said. Not everything, but uh, I managed to have a discussion with you afterwards. So, um, first of all, this is a, an image uh, I just took in the airplane before landing in Hamburg. I thought the cloudy, the clouds before uh, before landing in Hamburg were good as an introduction for a vision bomb. So, I would like to talk to you about the artists. Um, because I think the artist occupies a very clear position in, uh, in society. It's um, an artistic position. And I prefer to talk about artistic position than uh, about the artist as a person, as someone that is connected or, or goes to get together with his person. I think it is a position like there is a political position or a, a social worker or a scientist or a manager. The artist is, is not a politician, it's not a social worker, it's not a scientist, it's not a manager, it's not a policeman. And not because he's not doing politics or because uh, he has no effect on social programming or because he has no, nothing to do with science or with uh, management, but just because he does all this positioned as an artist. And I think this is really uh, where, where the difference is. When working in public space, for instance, the artist has only this position to specify what he does there. There is no other reason for him to be there than to be there as an artist and to, 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 to occupy that position. All the other conditions of artistic creation are <laughs> secondary to, to that position, which means that, um, like in, in an atelier, for instance, where um, an educa the educational position would be too dominant, or in a, in a museum where artists uh, could be forced in a scientific dogma, or in a, when a commissioner uh, forces this into a political message that is too uh, dominant, it all jeopardizes the artistic position, the artist. So, this, I think that this positional approach embraces the diversity and the subjectivity, like uh, Reinhard Karl talked about, if I understood well, uh, this afternoon. Uh, this, mehr, can you try to speak German now? Mehr Deutlichkeit. Yeah. Um, I think this fits very good with the positional approach of the artists. And it is really in opposition with the romantic vision of the artists as a highly individual, isolated genius, uh, which I think is a very counterproductive um, way to deal with art. It's, uh, it's really um, taking out the venom of uh, a lot of things that are going on now um, and that are going on since uh, a longer time in art world. Uh, just to explain the, f the photo, it's, uh, it's Marcel Brotax, a Belgian artist, going into the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Brussels in uh, 68 or 69 with a, um, a, a camera. So that's the artist. Then I just want to <coughs> say something about the art, the artwork itself, because the artwork is the output of this artistic position. And in our very materialistic and uh, capitalist world, we consider this output as an object, an object that is subject to speculation, despite the, and despite the struggle of uh, many artists to dematerialize, to dematerialize art, the art market always found ways to recuperate this and give it a value that can be speculated with. So I think if we speak about art as an object, as, <coughs> Uh, we have to talk about speculation. Um, I think that if any one of you uses uh, public money to speculate on the stock exchange, um, you end in jail. But if you use it to um, build an art collection, 
um, you get away with it. So that's a very strange um, um, contradiction, I think. Um, when we talk about speculation and about art as a material object, um, of course we talk about collectors and collections, people that want to collect art. They don't want to collect um, artistic positions, they want to collect the objects. So I think even if you talk about private or public collectors, they are all driven by different reasons to gather that art can be for passion for art, or wanting to belong to an artistic peer group, or um, patrimonial interests, financial investments, scientific interests, philanthropic ambitions. There are really a lot of reasons uh, for a lot of people to collect arts. Um, but I think then there's another the second thing when we talk about the art as an object, it's to talk about the interpretation, about how how uh, people start to interpret these things, these objects. And I think that once that the artist, uh, the artist has the, is, is the first privileged viewer of his own work, once he finished that work and it goes out of his hands, um, he leaves it to another person and this object becomes really a subject to interpretation. Um, all kinds of systems then um, that are related to power, try to use this power to impose a certain interpretation to the work. Um, collectors, dealers, historians, teachers, critics, the public opinion, religious or political powers, they all, in art history, they are on and still now, they all want to impose a certain way of looking and dealing with the work. We will never know now uh, what the brothers Van Eyck, this is a postcard of a really beautiful self-portrait of Jan van Eyck. We will never know um, <coughs> what the brothers van Eyck really felt or really wanted to say when they were painting the mystic lamp, for instance, uh, their masterpiece. The work became a bearer of many interpretations and changes of status during the history. So from the moment it leaves their hands, it becomes something that is really um, influenced by the way people uh, dealt with that object. Um, yeah, and I think that the, the, the one of the, the, the strong things about artworks is that they, they are objects that are able to, to accumulate these influences throughout history. Um, I'm talking now about Van Eyck because this is a very safe and very far uh, subject for in history, but you can you can even think if if what Dubuffet said about um, about Arcut and, and the way he dealt with that, if you can now in how we use it now in all our lectures and in how we look at it now, if we can still um, try to to go back to what he really meant, what what was his what he really wanted to to um, to do with it as as an artist. A third uh, item I wanted to present was the art museum. Um, the art museum is a place to collect, it's a place to study, it's a place to show and a place to med mediate art. Um, the artist can be a player in this, but the artwork is even more so. So the, 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 um, yeah, every museum has to uh, I go back to my, my sentence before. The, the artist can be a player in this. So I mean that uh, a lot of uh, museums now uh, are dealing with living artists, artists that uh, are invited to do something in the museum. To uh, our, like we visit a lot of ateliers, we visit a lot of artists. We invite also artists to work with. So there, there is a direct communication and a direct. Um, Passing, by, passing over of uh, knowledge about the work. But in a lot of cases, it's not, it's not like that. It's not like that. You only have the work to, to uh, do that. And all the knowledge and the interpretations that were given before to that work. Um, 
And I think that every museum has to deal with this complex balance of different influences and, and powers. And when I came from SMAC Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and started to work at Mount Musée in Liège, uh, that was very exciting to me, to be confronted again with these very basic questions about what is this? What is this object? Uh, what does it mean? What do the artists think? Um, how do we read this object and, uh, and, and this artistic meaning within history? How did others interpret it or used it in the past? How, how can we preserve it? How do we pre preserve it? Or where do we preserve it? Um, what's the place of that object within the collection we already have? Um, also, how does it fit in, in our development as a museum? Where was it before it came here? How do we write or talk about this work? What's the response of the public to this work? What's the importance of the work now? For who? I think all these questions, when I worked in the um, Museum of Contemporary Art, were a lot more loaded already. There were a lot of references you have to take care of, you have to take in account. You cannot start from zip when you talk about um, Marcel Brotas, for instance. So uh, when I uh, started to work in the museum in Liège, I saw a lot of works where I was more or less one of the first to, to be able to develop a kind of knowledge or interpretation to that work. And I will come back to that later when I talk about the next exhibition we do uh, next week in Liège. Um, I think also that um, the art world, um, in opposition to what we usually think, is really not uh, very creative or progressive. It, in fact, it's a very conservative environment. Um, a, a lot of uh, institutions or people that work uh, in art world um, have a very fixed idea of how we have to deal with this um, and to make a, a caricature of that. <coughs> I think you can say framed objects on a wall um, and, and this can change a little bit uh, depending on the fashion of the day. Yeah. It's often even really hostile to change. Um, so I think it is very important to be aware of that when you deal with museums, art galleries, collectors, people from the art world. Because it's a very uh, normal, normalizing, normalizing uh, mechanism. The, 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 idea, the whole idea is to, to normalize what is going in. And so I think we have to do that in a very intelligent, intelligent way. And if we want to have a change in that mechanism, it will be very slow and we will need a lot of time. <coughs> I think time is really important. I think we, um, as a museum, have to be able to think outside of the time frame of our next exhibition and, um, and to think about what, what, how, is, what our, how are our decisions uh, influencing on the longer time what will be normal in the future. Um, and I also think that in doing that, we have to embrace the complexity. I heard from what I understood of it, a lot of people talking about this complexity. And, um, and I think we have to embrace that. Um, I think the question are, uh, is das Kunst? Or c'est de l'art? Or is that Kunst? Or is it art? In every other language, it's always coming back wherever you are. And not only when you talk about the art we are dealing with, but also when I was working in contemporary art museum, the same questions are, uh, are there and they are legitimate. So it's, um, it's to the museum to try to, uh, to play with that. And then the, the, almost the last, is life. I think it's a really important also um, <coughs> you know that meanwhile life goes on and things are changing. So um, I think that uh, culture is a is a broader a broader complexity in which art 
takes that specific position. And it's good to know that. It's good to know that it's, um, it's also about how you have breakfast or how you went through a building uh, when you talk about culture. It has to do with all these things too. Uh, and that is also influencing the artist, of course. But also the other instruments of forces around the world. So the museum, the public convenience, the perception, they are all also influenced by what's going on <coughs> meanwhile. It's not something isolated. When you look to art, you also think about what, who you are now and where you are and what's going on uh, in the world. And I think when we talk about artists with learning disabilities, um, and I specify in, in Europe or in Western countries, to know that in the last 30 years, the conditions they work in uh, dramatically changed. It's a, it's a very new phenomenon. And um, uh, no one can predict the future of the ateliers, for instance. Um, uh, as we know them now, we don't know if they will uh, still exist in that form uh, in the future. Um, it's, some, it's a very recent phenomenon that developed um, very quickly also as a heritage of the 69th generation. I think it's, it's part of that. And in some uh, countries, or some um, in some countries, you see that together with this heritage of '69, they are pulled back, or um, um, they are now in a very uh, precarious condition. Um, if we see, uh, for instance, the ateliers in in, uh, in Italy, um, and how how hard it is for them now. To, um, to maintain what they have and to continue to work and to develop their work uh, within the conditions they are working in, I don't know uh, how this will develop and how it will evolve. And I'm very happy to see a lot of people here in Germany and I feel like you have everything very good uh, <laughs> set. But um, I think we have to be aware of that. Um, we have to be aware of um, how, how this will um, evolve and that it is not something that is <coughs> can be taken for granted. Um, also, I think um, to question if this kind of context for creation uh, will continue to exist as we know it, um, I want to say I don't care. As long as the artists um, continue to have a good condition to develop their work, maybe it has to change. Um, and then I'm not even talk, talking about how it is for a, a person with uh, learning disabilities to grow up in a city like Lagos or, uh, or uh, Beijing. I mean, it, it is also very um, specific for our, uh, our perception of society and the place uh, artists with disabilities can take, artists in general and persons with disabilities as well can take in that. Also, the museum is part of, this, is part of a city. It's part of city life. Um, um, I think it, it will, uh, it's, uh, it's also changing. It's, um, it needs to be a cultural place where things happen um, and people want to be part of that. Uh, also there, in the museum, the artistic position is only one of several positions needed to, to have a museum. Um, so it's good that museums are in a continued change, even if I just said before that um, it is a very conservative uh, environment, so that uh, it will need time. Yeah? And then, Mad Museum, this is, uh, I just took some pictures with my computer yesterday, so that's my visit my, my, uh, my cart, the back of my cart. It's part of the, of the building of the museum. Um, after these general things, I just wanted to, to, to talk a bit about how Mad Musée is dealing with that. For that, it's important to know the history of the museum. We uh, started, or the collection of the museum started as a collection from Créam. And Créam is an atelier in Liège. Uh, funded by Luc Boulanger at the end of the 70s, which is an artist. And he wanted to gather some 
people with uh, learning disabilities around him to create work together as an artist outside of institutions, outside, outside of care uh, constructions. Uh, he did in Liège and he squatted an empty um, a pavilion in a park. Um, and with their first exhibition, the mayor uh, said that they can stay there forever in that pavilion in the park. And they very um, quickly developed their uh, work as an atelier and invited other artists from outside so that other ateliers were also in the same time, beginning of the, beginning of the 80s, were developing um, all around Europe and all around the world. <coughs> and it was also the beginning or the period of the beginning of the European uh, projects. And so they did, uh, they, they used that. And they were very fast in being part of a broader network that allowed a lot of artists to come. And they also, beside of the atelier work, had exhibitions. And I think this is the, the embryo of what Matt Musée is now, these exhibitions and this exchange of works, exchange of artists. Uh, because the, the atelier developed, continued to, to develop, and then the collection grew and gradually um, uh, at Kheam, uh, people started to, to uh, realize that it was really important to develop a, a, a work around this collection. And first it was Centre d'Art Différencier. Art Différencier is a word invented by Luc Boulanger. Um, and then Musée d'Art Différencier, and since 1998 it's really a museum. Since 2008 it's recognized by the uh, Walloon government. I will not explain you how Belgium is in this constitution, but it means it's, um, it's uh, recognized officially by a cultural uh, ministry as a museum. Um, from that moment, uh, people decided before I was there that uh, Musée d'Art Différencier, that they would not use anymore the name Art Différencier because they were the only one to use it. So they called it Mad Musée. And now we have a lot of problems with that name. <laughs> because when we deal with uh, uh, English-speaking artists, it's really hard to tell them, we are glad to show you where you finally will be shown in a real museum. And when they ask, in what museum, to tell them in that museum. <laughs> so it's very uh, contradictory to what we really want to do. Because the relationship with the artists and the relationship with the ateliers are the two really main uh, relationships, beside of the public, of course, that we want to set up as a museum. Um, I think 98% of the works that are in the collection, we have more or less 2,000 works, were made by artists with mental disabilities, working in the context of an atelier from everywhere in the world. Um, so for us, it's important, since this is our collection and this is what we refer to, it is important to, um, to study that, to know what we talk about and to try to name it and to be precise in, um, in what it is. Um, because I think it's also important to name things correctly. Uh, that's why we have also problems with our name. Because <laughs> when I say this is a, a chair, it will change the life of that pen. So it's uh, important. Um, so we, have, we do a lot of visits to ateliers. We invite a lot of ateliers. Once in a year, we do an, um, an exhibition together with an atelier, where we invite them to work with us. Next time will be Atelier de Villa uh, next year. And we really create uh, an exhibition together with them. We also have monographical exhibitions once a year where we invite one artist to do an overview of his work, an artist, an important artist from the collection. And it's, it comes together with a, a catalogue about his work. So it, there's a collection of catalogues growing now with a monographical uh, interest in the work of, the, of the, these artists. We also do uh, collection exhibitions, of course, in our own museum since we don't have a place anymore to show the whole collection. Um, and we do uh, duo exhibitions where we show two artists 
um, because I think that it's uh, an interesting relationship to have a relationship between two. It's not a group exhibition, it's not a solo exhibition, but it puts, it changes your perception as public when you see the work in dialogue or confrontation with another work. And that's uh, how we showed the work of uh, Adolf Beutler last year. Last year or two years ago? Maybe, you know, help me. Uh, together with the work of Johan Hienens, another artist uh, from Belgium. But not necessarily both are uh, working in ateliers. We also, so that's uh, a more open. Another uh, relationship we want to build up is a relationship with collectors, because I think this is something that is very underused um, in, in museums in, uh, in Europe, <coughs> or in Liège. <laughs> Um, is that uh, there are a lot of collections, a lot of people are really interested in collecting these works and um, these private collectors um, don't have this strong relationship with the museum like it exists in museums in, uh, in America for instance or in England. And I think um, there are a lot of problems with this relationship but it is worth um, trying to establish a good relationship uh, with this, so this is for, for me. This is something we have to work to. We have to to um, to try to build up something where our strength or our uh, know-how as a museum can be used by collectors for what they are doing and vice versa. Um, and another, it's always a bit about relationships. Um, another relationship we also find is really important is the one between our exhibition program and the, um, and the collection. Because the collection, as I said before, is our reference for the choices that we make. And also, when we show an artist, it's an opportunity to have work of this artist in our collection. So it's something that feeds one to the other. And that is, that, um, it makes it possible to grow um, slowly, but to grow, to grow with uh, regarding to the, the, what is behind us, which is the collection that is pushing us a little bit forward, but also to know, yes, this is what we know, but we want to go in that direction or a little bit to that direction, and it can push you in different direction with this uh, exhibition program. It's an opportunity to try new things, to try if this, is, this fits in that history of the collection or not. And that's why we are, uh, and now I come to what we do now. That's why we, inv uh, we invited Honoré Do. Honoré Do is a, a contemporary artist from uh, Belgium, from Ghent. And he, uh, we invited him to, to look at our collection and to curate uh, exhi an, a collection exhibition. Um, his work is uh, very, uh, how I, it's very hard to describe, but he has a very allergic reaction to material things. He, he always tries to get rid of that, to, to, to dematerialize. He likes to work with foam or things that, are, that we think are nasty. Like this. And, um, and using that in big installations in, in, this, in the exhibition space. To give an example, he uh, did the work for Over the Edges, uh, an exhibition in public space in Ghent, where he, uh, he put a, uh, a glass ball, uh, a nickel, no, cake, uh, what do you call that? What you play, what children play it? A glass ball? Vogel. 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 So, you understand what I mean? Yeah. He, he put it uh, in the air with invisible strings. In the, in the very historical touristic center of Ghent. And the work was about all these people looking in the air and trying to find it, and then one saying, oh, I think it's there. And you see groups of people staring at something that the others cannot see. So just to, to tell you how immaterial this work normally is. He, um, he really surprised me when I invited him to see the collection. He was very enthusiastic about the collection, uh, looking to the, all the different works there and wanting to see more and more. But on the other hand, he immediately um, 
didn't want to impose um, this <laughs> interpretation. He said, I, I don't care what you think about the work and I don't want to impose my interpretation to that. What is really interesting is that uh, is my enthusiasm of being in contact with that work, of seeing it, discovering it. And that's the enthusiasm I would like to communicate to the audience in the exhibition. So he, uh, he proposed an installation in the museum. Uh, we have to build it up next week, so I, I can't tell you if it works, but uh, I hope so. Where, when you enter the museum, there is a first a, a kind of tunnel with bright lights, where you really, uh, when you come in, the light go on, and then you go out and the light goes out, and you are in, then in the exhibition space, which will be very uh, obscure, very dark, with, um, uh, what do you call it, a noble, uh, a furniture Furniture. that is made for the exhibition, um, that is made for couples to meet. And uh, there, are, there will be volunteers that we invite to be there and to use the installation. And they will uh, have a conversation with the visitor around the work. So the work will be first presented on that furniture as with a light on it, as something that is far away from you. But then they will take it out, out of the frame, take it out of that, that place and put it just next to the visitor to have it very close to you, just like when, you, when we read a book together you know, and look at the pictures and talk about it. And um, I think it's, um, it's a very, I'm, I'm really excited about knowing how the, the audience will respond to that because it gives away, it puts away what the museum does and it is creating a kind of distance to, to the work and imposing a kind of interpretation that we know and that we think is relevant to the work. The museum is a bit out of this because at that moment the only interpretation that counts is the, the conversation that grows around that work and it's, um, I'm really uh, looking forward to see how that works because the people we will invite will not be specialists but just people with sensibility about art in general. Um, so that's for next week. And another thing that is coming on is that we will have a new museum, a new building, and so we will close in April 2014, have big works in the museum and reopen in September 15. So if you want to visit us, you have to be quick. <laughs> and while we are closed, we will go on with doing exhibitions uh, abroad. Like we, we are invited to show the collection at Intuit in Chicago and also in Paris, and if someone wants to show it in Germany, you're welcome. So that's what I wanted to say. There are a lot of things I didn't talk about, um, and maybe these are the most interesting. I don't know. Thank you.